still in South Africa. And the co-coordinator of the Right to the City program at the Polis Institute in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Nelson, you have seven minutes to speak and we will be strict with the timing. Thank you very much and over to you. Thank you, Judith. Good morning uh, for all. Buenos dias. Yo voy a hablar en español, portuñol. Y, bueno, mi nombre es Nelson Stalley Jr. Yo soy de la organización brasileña Polis, Instituto Polis, que es una de las organizaciones que está en el grupo de apoyo, el equipo de apoyo de la Plataforma Global pelo Direito a la Ciudad, que es una, es una red que estamos trabajando con varias organizaciones que están aquí presentes, ¿no? eh, que desde <coughs> el proceso de la conferencia de Habitat 3 estamos trabajando juntos para la diseminación y también para la incidencia de los derechos a la ciudad como un marco referencial importante para las políticas en nuestras ciudades en especial con la cuestión de la sustentabilidad de ciudades justas, democráticas sostenibles e inclusivas. Y, y justamente por eso que en el High Level Panel, ¿no? que, eso, que siempre se organiza por Naciones Unidas eh, para hacer un balance, evaluación ¿no? de cómo están los países con sus compromisos con la Agenda 2030 y con los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible, que tenemos siempre teniendo esta iniciativa de termos eh, espacios de diálogo ¿no? sobre temas que consideramos fundamentales eh, dentro de la perspectiva de la implementación de esta agenda global. Y siempre hacemos una imbricación muy importante también con la nueva agenda urbana, que este año, ¿no? ya se hace cinco años de la conferencia de Habitat 3, y los países están haciendo eh, sus balanços, ¿no? sus avaliaciones oficiales a través de reporters, relatorios eh, nacionales. Y consideramos que es muy importante traer ¿no? la cuestión de las responsabilidades, los compromisos y las obligaciones que los países tienen con relación directa a la ciudad. Y, y para nosotros es, es muy importante no, que podamos eh, tener dentro de este panel, de este diálogo, ¿no? apuntar algunas recomendaciones, apuntar algunas cuestiones centrais para o, este High Level Panel. ¿no? Y claro que vamos a estar participando también de otros eventos importantes. Eh, por parte de la, la cuestión de la plataforma de Direito a la Ciudad, ¿no? eh, Está muy claro que en este periodo de la, la pandemia ¿no? de, de COVID-19 eh, en, nuestro, en nuestros países eh, está más do que relevante ¿no? que los, los compromisos de esas agendas globales sean implementados en nuestros países, en nuestras ciudades. ¿no? Eh, la cuestión de la desigualdad social y territorial que está que tenemos en la mayoría de las ciudades del mundo, eh, está muy eh, imbricada ¿no? con los propios efectos e impactos de la pandemia. Acá en Brasil eh, es muy claro que las personas que son más víctima, víctimas ¿no? de la, la pandemia están justamente viviendo eh, en, en las periferias urbanas, y nos asentamientos informales como las favelas, ¿no? y mismo con la relación a la cuestión de la vacuna, ¿no? de, 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 de la cuestión de, de la vacunación, y, y está muy claro que es lo, la abrangencia ¿no? es mejor, menor en esos, en esos locales donde las personas viven en nuestras ciudades. Y, 
Y una de, de, de las cuestiones que, que, que queremos ¿no? eh, trabajar en este diálogo es eh, justamente cómo se trabaja con esta realidad que estamos viviendo en nuestras ciudades y que muchas cosas se van a cambiar ¿no? y se van a seguir. Eh, un, un, un de los aspectos que nos llama, me parece muy importante, es la cuestión de lo, lo derecho a la ciudad y la dimensión de cómo vamos a, a planificar y mejorar la, lo uso de nuestros espacios en nuestras ciudades para se combater esa desigualdad social y territorial. Y uno de los aspectos que traemos es que precisamos tener una otra visión de, de nuestras ciudades. Por eso la visión que tenemos del derecho a la ciudad es la perspectiva de la ciudad como un bien común, la ciudad sin ningún tipo de discriminación, la ciudad con la ciudadanía más inclusiva, <coughs> que se considere como ciudadanos, como habitantes de las ciudades, las personas que viven en las calles, las personas que trabajan ¿no? en las calles, lo, la cuestión del trabajo eh, informal, la cuestión que es de las personas que viven en los asentamientos informales, ¿no? los inmigrantes, que sean también considerados y que tengan también como condiciones de ser sujetos políticos en nuestras ciudades, en los procesos de tomada de decisiones fundamentales en nuestras ciudades. La ciudad con igualdad de género y con la cuestión de la diversidad sexual y por eso la cuestión de los espacios públicos nos parece muy importante para la cuestión de también se garantir esta igualdad. <coughs> La ciudad con economía inclusiva, la ciudad que cumple la su función social, ¿no? la ciudad que está, establece claramente una protección lo, al medio ambiente y también que se establece claramente una conexión entre la, las personas que viven en las áreas urbanas y rurales con la extensión de los derechos, acceso a servicios ¿no? y también el acceso a la condiciones de calidad de vida y de dignidad. ¿no? Estos son algunos elementos que trabajamos dentro de la visión del derecho a la ciudad y que son compromisos que están firmados, por ejemplo, en el objetivo 11 sobre las ciudades sostenibles, con la cuestión de vivienda, los espacios públicos, la, de, la movilidad urbana, la defensa de la, también de lo, la calidad de los espacios públicos, del patrimonio histórico y de los derechos culturales, y en la nueva agenda urbana, la perspectiva de los derechos humanos y con estos compromisos que están también firmados en la nueva agenda urbana. Y es de esta manera que, que queremos trabajar ¿no? en esta incidencia dentro de estos espacios institucionales y principalmente para que los países consideren ¿no? en sus compromisos, en sus acciones, en sus iniciativas, esta, esta imbricación, esta vinculación entre los compromisos de esas, nuevas, de esas dos agendas globales con los derechos humanos y con la visión y la perspectiva de implementación de los derechos de la ciudad. Sería eh, inicialmente, ¿no? Eh, estas cuestiones que quería traer para este diálogo. Gracias. Thank you very much, Nelson, for setting the scene. Um, I would just like to add a few considerations to what Nelson has already said. In the 59th edition of the UN Commission on Social Development last February, the UN Secretary General highlighted the need to include social and solidarity economy as a means of introducing a different economic model that would help us to build efficiency and social and environmental resilience. Now, if I link that to what Nelson has said. Nelson, you mentioned the informal sector. And I think that it is very important to work on supporting those people who are still in the informal sector today. 
if we look at the figures that were quoted yesterday and the day before in the opening days of the HLPF, we have 83 million additional people who are going hungry officially, between 119 and 124 million people who have entered extreme poverty officially, and officially 255 million jobs that have been lost. Now that is without taking the figures for the informal sector into account. And I believe that they are probably double if we do take the informal sector into account. So as we are in the context of the SDGs, obviously this addresses SDG 1, ending poverty, SDG 2, ending hunger. As Nelson rightly mentioned, the cities where an increasing amount of humanity comes together but also SDG 8 in terms of decent work and above all in our side event, SDG 17, which is about partnerships. So without further ado, I would like to pass the floor now to Sonia, Sonia Diaz. Sonia is a sociologist who refers to herself also as a garbologist. Since 1985, she has been integrating social aspects into the technical planning of waste collection and recycling, which as we know in our planet today is a very key issue. She's a former city officer of Belo Horizonte in Brazil, and she also has a political science PhD and is in charge in WeGo of global waste questions. So Sonia, I know it's early in Brazil, but over to you and thank you very much. Uh, well, a very good morning for those who are in this side of the world, the global south, or a very good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, we will be sharing a bit on our work with way speakers with a particular focus on cooperatives as pathway to dignified work and to as pathways for implementation of sustainable development. So I want you uh, very quickly to walk you through who are the way speakers. They are those who collect, sort, recycle, or repurpose, uh, and sell materials that we throw away in the garbage. Uh, according to the ILO uh, Green Jobs uh, study, there are 20 million uh, people earning their livelihoods from uh, waste. And although they provide important work to city solid waste management systems and also contribute to uh, the mitigation of greenhouse gas, they are very, uh, very often they are not recognized by cities and also by the industry. And during COVID-19, it became quite clear how they were affected, how they are in a more, uh, in, a, yeah, in, a, in a greater vulnerability uh, during the pandemic. Uh, they live and sometimes, they work and sometimes live in open downs. They work very often with a lack of access of equipment. And uh, since COVID-19, we realized that uh, medical waste, you know, increased uh, from homes and office. And so all of that brings an additional layer of uh, vulnerability to waste speakers, uh, especially for women waste speakers. And so WIGU was very quickly uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, drafting guidelines for uh, uh, protocols, health protocols uh, for way speakers, and also we started monitoring 
uh, this situation, the impact of COVID-19. One such monitoring was the study that we carried out here in my country, Brazil, and uh, in the first round last year, we uh, surveyed 140 cooperatives across 23 states in my country. And in the early uh, uh, beginning of the pandemic, we found out that 73% of the cooperatives had to uh, interrupt their activities. And but. However, they were very quick in terms of uh, learning about uh, what were the needs uh, for uh, security, safe work in their cooperatives. And back then, when we surveyed them, uh, we had 51 suspected cases of COVID, and we uh, started supporting them to fundraise for uh, basic access to uh, basic income, food baskets, and personal protection equipment, and started building capacity of workers for uh, virtual meetings and many other uh, issues. So you can see here in uh, this uh, figure how, you know, way speakers co-ops quickly introduce many of the safety protocols recommended, like isolation of at-risk individuals, uh, cleaning with hypochlorite, and many other uh, uh, measures. So this year, we conducted another uh, round of this uh, survey, uh, this time with 130 cooperatives. And we could see uh, that 99% of the co-ops kept the new uh, protocols, uh, but that there was an increase in the suspected and confirmed cases of COVID-19. And we know that these uh, workers, they uh, have to expose themselves in public transport, that they live in cramped places. So there are uh, risks that they're exposed to beyond uh, uh, their work environment. And we also we started to implement uh, uh, courses around building capacity for uh, workers to work in virtual environment. And I will speak about that very uh, you know, soon. Uh, and we could see co-ops resilience uh, that they uh, introduced the new protocols and were able to articulate allies to support them in their campaign. So our study shows that co the cooperative's ability to work towards a recovery, but also the many hurdles that they face. Uh, so uh, last year, uh, around September, we started an OSF WIBU funded project here in Brazil, and it's called Cata Saúde Project. We took a capacity building, building into the WhatsApp environment and Facebook YouTube environments, and we built capacity of around uh, 488 organized and non-organized workers in content uh, related to OHS, occupational and health safety, cooperative movement, social protection, and many other aspects that are relevant for workers uh, in terms of building resilience. And so what we can see is that COVID-19 has brought devastating impacts on the lives of informal workers. And WIGO is monitoring and, uh, these impacts and it's also supporting them in their campaigns. And we can see through the work that we carried out here in our study in Brazil that cooperatives are a pathway for dignified uh, work. And so we need to support way speakers as service providers in a solid way systems. We need to support them in their struggles to the right to the cities in terms of demanding the necessary urban infrastructure that provides dignified work. And we have a big challenge, which is the embracement of the principles of the new urban agenda by policymakers. But we believe that cooperatives bring uh, gender equality and also is a pathway for the implementation of decent work conditions. And although they act as a buffer, they also face many hurdles that we need to take into account and plan accordingly. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Sonia. That was really, really very significant because it shows that there are really cross-cutting issues between health, food, housing, transport, work, social protection, and that they are all deeply interlinked. That unless we do work in partnership and collectively, we will fail to achieve the SDGs and fail those in most need of our support and protection. So it's been a very important presentation. Thank you. I would now like to turn to complete this aspect to Simel Essim. Simel, you are a feminist economist and you lead the ILO co-op unit where you're responsible for co-ops and other social solidarity economy issues. And I really believe that some of the importance of bringing informal workers into formal employment through these co-ops. So you have seven minutes to talk to us now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. It is indeed very complimentary. And so Sonia and I go uh, well together. We've done uh, this uh, before on numerous occasions uh, as well. So uh, as you noted, the unfolding crises around the pandemic has further exacerbated the existing inequalities within and across uh, countries. The loss in labor income has been distributed unevenly between workers, youth, women, low skilled skilled workers are seeing the largest, uh, sharpest uh, drops in income. And with the mandatory lockdowns, uh, informal economy workers like street vendors, uh, domestic workers, home-based workers, uh, waste pickers were among uh, the first to lose their jobs. More than 2 billion workers are informally employed around the world, but this number is in fact before the pandemic and uh, it is uh, likely that uh, many more who lost their jobs are seeking for employment uh, informally. And in developing countries, women constitute the majority of uh, informally employed. And they set up uh, these collectives, self-help groups, cooperatives, and other social and solidarity economy organizations to improve livelihoods, to get access to services, markets, uh, uh, and to improve, of course, collective voice and negotiation power. During the pandemic, uh, as Sonia has also indicated, uh, cooperatives and uh, associations of waste pickers and wider social and solidarity economy organizations have come through for their members, uh, raising funds, ensuring market access for some of their products and services as much as uh, they could to uh, stop it to work in lockdowns with permits disseminating uh, protective equipment information and advocating with governments uh, for their members, including especially and importantly with local governments. For instance, in the case of home-based workers, those producing for global supply chains were particularly affected uh, by the lockdown and their incomes uh, depend heavily uh, on these orders, uh, which were suspended coming from higher income countries in the textile and apparel sectors. Um, Homemade South Asia notes that of uh, close to a million uh, of their members, only around 10% had access to work. And that 10% that had access to work uh, actually were members of cooperatives uh, and uh, producer uh, organizations. Um, during this period, of, uh, also SSC organizations of women in formal economy workers have raised funds through international solidarity, for instance. Self-Employed Women's Association, which has a membership of uh, 1.8 million uh, members in India and organized through both trade unions and uh, cooperatives and collectives, uh, has uh, actually raised the uh, funds uh, from, uh, for instance, the international cooperative movement. Uh, most recently, 10 UK uh, cooperatives uh, supported uh, uh, with uh, a substantial uh, funding uh, the uh, activities of the Cooperative Federation of uh, Sewa. 
Uh, Seva also co-op mass involved in crafts and in Ayurvedic medicine production, shifted production uh, to PPEs and hand sanitizers as a way to keep work flowing to their members, but also for a low cost provision of these goods uh, in their communities. Of course, this is a well-known model. It has inspired many, including uh, those in my country, in Turkey. I also want to say a, a few words around care because um, uh, it is a critical to overcoming inequalities, especially gender inequalities around the provision of care and how it is organized. Uh, and even without the pandemic and the uh, ensuing crisis, caring responsibilities usually fell heavily on women. The pandemic has uh, further exposed the deficits in uh, care provision and how we organize it uh, in our societies around the world. Um, Affordable and accessible child care is critical for women working in essential services as we are discussing the pan, uh, pandemic environment, but those returning to work and, as, of course, the, those working in the informal economy. Uh, there is a, a growing momentum around care provision through cooperatives around the world, especially in aging societies. Uh, but also uh, for, uh, for instance, informal economy workers, both for their own care needs, and uh, this is something Sonia can speak to, but also for them to organize as home care workers and domestic workers to improve the terms and conditions of their work. For instance, in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, after operating as a, a union of domestic workers for more than 40 years, the National Union of uh, Domestic Employees decided to set up uh, a membership-based collective enterprise for the uh, empowerment of their the, uh, members, domestic workers. And this co-op provides job matching, skills training, accountancy, uh, et cetera, services. It's also trying to equip its members to, uh, uh, to go into different types of work, uh, including, for instance, um, even within the uh, cleaning sector, let's say, to get office contracts uh, or institutional cleaning contracts. In the US, especially among immigrant women and women of color, domestic workers and home care worker cooperatives have been growing in numbers with support from community-based organizations and worker cooperative unions, uh, but also the critical law, law of the municipalities and the local government needs to be emphasized here, making it possible, uh, both from the regulatory perspective, but also from the financing perspective, to uh, make uh, these cooperatives possible. And uh, even uh, these uh, initiatives, of course, struggled during the pandemic. Uh, and in building resilience, uh, I think, beyond the pandemic, innovative uh, initiatives for uh, scaling up will be needed, they will be useful. Uh, these can be the vertical organizations of these primary level uh, social and solidarity economy initiatives, like networks and platforms and unions, but also others. Uh, for instance, again, Again, uh, with the domestic worker co-op example that I was giving in the US, they've started a franchising model to expand business ownership for low-income domestic workers in the work form of worker cooperatives. And uh, with the support of the uh, municipality, the local government in New York, they have set up a number of these. And they also use uh, platform applications to better match their members with potential employers. Such platform co-ops are also being tried uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, for instance, um, most recently in South Africa, among I the domestic. I'm going to have to cut you off because you're over your seven minutes. Okay. <laughs> It's so dense, you've given us so much fantastic information. Um, I've picked up on a lot of things you've said, but one thing I would particularly like to emphasize is that in so much of this, and you did mention it, it is the local authorities reef that is the important one, not just national and international. And coming from one of the foremost UN bodies, the ILO, which is unique, 
I think that it is very important to emphasize all of this because we can only achieve full recovery and decent work if we do go down the roads that you have outlined for us. So thank you very much indeed, Simel. And again, apologies for cutting you off. <laughs> I would now like to turn to Andre Luzzi. Andre is a member of Habitat International Coalition. And most importantly, he is a member of the coordination committee of the civil society and indigenous peoples mechanism of the committee on world food security, where he represents the urban poor and Andre and I have worked a lot on the food related issues. So I'm very happy to have you here with us today, Andre. So over to you and many thanks. Hola, gracias Judith por la, por la invitación. Gracias también por poder hablar acerca de este punto de vista que es la cuestión de la alimentación, de la agricultura y también con los derechos a ciudad sobre una perspectiva de economía social y solidaria, porque así podemos ver los ODS de una mirada integral, no solamente uno a uno, pero también de una forma articulada y una perspectiva que pueda eh, sanar las distintas dimensiones de la vida, de la sociedad y también por las cuestiones ambientales. Así traemos en nuestra comunicación un tanto de las contribuciones producidas colectivamente a respecto de los impactos, de los efectos de la pandemia, que son distintos, y estamos en dis distintos momentos de la pandemia y sus efectos en nuestros países también. Pero también hay evidencia de las respuestas comunitarias para garantizar los derechos humanos a la alimentación, y que son muy fuertes y que vamos a poner acá en este debate con ustedes. También tenemos análisis y eh, registros de acciones juntos a las acciones de agricultura apoyada por la comunidad, estudios hechos por Urgens y también por otros uh, institutos, que es muy importante para ver las distintas perspectivas para políticas transformadoras de los sistemas alimentarios. Y por fin, queremos hablar un poquito de la experiencia de articulación de Coalición Internacional de Hábitat. Lo que nos parece es que tenemos acciones de distintas formas de economía solidaria y también una acción muy importante de agenda, agenda básica. Este fue un punto muy importante y necesario para que las personas tengan recursos económicos para acceder a los alimentos de calidad. También fue muy interesante la creación de fondos colectivos comunales para la compra de alimentos agroecológicos o de base agroecológicas. Pero en nuestros estudios Vemos que ahora es importante perceber cómo estas experiencias pueden ganar fuerzas y también eh, traer contribuciones para las políticas en nivel local y también para las ciudades. Cómo los gobiernos locales pueden a, eh, aprender las enseñanzas de estas prácticas en nivel de, locales a partir de prácticas solidarias de suministros. Y estas perspectivas de una red de suministro popular ve una perspectiva nueva y muy importante, que es la articulación en las áreas rurales, urbanas, de los bosques y del agua. Digo, las personas que viven en ríos y mares o viven de estos espacios para su sobrevivencia. O sea, las compras colectivas comunales de los pequeños productores fueron tan importantes y los gobiernos necesitan ampliar, hacer más fuertes estos programas de compras colectivas, como por ejemplo para la alimentación en las escuelas de los jóvenes, y que en muchos sitios estos programas se cejaron y esto fue un impacto muy fuerte para los niños. Y entonces es muy importante mantener estos programas de compras colectivas. La creación o fortalecimiento de logística inteligente para agilizar y acondicionamiento de los productos. Pero no solamente como una perspectiva instrumental de una logística tal, pero nuevas formas de convivencia, de vínculos comunitarios. 
una logística que cría nuevos sentimientos de pertenecimiento de las comunidades y su entorno. Hay necesidad de apoyo y diversificación de la asistencia técnica de base agroecológica. Hemos percibido que para estas redes de suministros permanecer en activas, es muy importante que los productores puedan planear su producción y tengan condiciones de llegar a los mercados, a las almacenes y también a los espacios de comercialización justas. Las donaciones a las inicia iniciativas comunitarias de producción fueron muy importantes. Y aquí es un punto central para hacer un contrapunto a las donaciones y la forma de cooptación de las corporaciones. Aquí es un punto central. Como nosotros, los pueblos, trabajadores, trabajadoras, productores en pequeñas escalas, podemos hacer una red de suministro que aseguren la participación de los productores, de los consumidores y las eviten los intereses de la, del capital y los intereses de las corporaciones. También es muy importante que aprendamos estas lecciones con acciones de visibilidad y educación para una alimentación saludable. Porque, mira, estamos cada vez con más condiciones de las personas ver que tenemos una otra forma de hacer sistemas alimentarios saludables y sustentables. Pero ahora tenemos que mostrar para las personas cómo hacer esto. Y nuestras experiencias pueden hacer cajas de herramientas para que las personas puedan se ver sensibilizadas y que se involucren en estas formas de redes populares de suministro. Esto para nos es un punto muy sencillo, porque puede hacer frente también a una perspectiva económica de base neoliberal que hasta hoy piensa la alimentación para las grandes cadenas de alimentos y también para la exportación. Y con esta otra mirada de circuitos cortos podemos nos involucrar con la ciudad, planear la ciudad y crear espacios protegidos para la agricultura urbana y periurbana. Sabemos que muchas ciudades vienen haciendo algunas acciones no están estructurales acerca de la agricultura urbana y periurbana. Y ahora, con la pandemia, vemos que los sistemas alimentarios se quedaron muy estresados y la perspectiva de hacer la aproximación de los consumidores y los productores y utilizar la base también de las ciudades para producir fueron muy, muy importantes. Y esto también es una forma de la ciudad no hacer impacto a los campos, a las partes rurales y también de los bosques. Es muy importante también crear apoyo y de diversificación de la asistencia técnica a estos productores en la ciudad. Y con esto, fortalecer los programas de compras públicas. De la misma forma, el acceso a agua potable y de calidad fue un punto central tanto para las medidas sanitarias, pero también para su hidratación de las personas, de las personas y para okay. producción. De... I need to ask you to conclude, please. Yes, ok. Sí, sí. Y entonces, la agua potable fue muy importante para nuestra garantizar la seguridad alimentaria en las ciudades. Y por fin, creo que hay un punto sensible que es garantizar la participación y exigibilidad del derecho a ciudad. Así, el fortalecimiento de los consejos de participación, las tecnologías digitales para comprender las demandas de las poblaciones y dónde están. Y concluyo, vean, hicimos un trabajo en San Pablo para comprender dónde están las personas en inseguridad alimentaria. Y también en Colombia, las personas usaron telas rojas en sus ventanas para decir que estaban con hambre. Entonces, necesitamos de sistemas de protección sociales y también de datos para comprender las necesidades de los pueblos. Muchas gracias a todos y a todas. Gracias.
Thank you very much indeed, Andre, for that very complete uh, presentation on food-related issues. I'd like to mention two things that struck me, two or three things. First of all, you did mention the urban-rural linkages and the importance of this, because to feed people in the cities, we need to be able to protect and preserve agricultural land, particularly in peri-urban regions. And again, this is a question of zoning that comes down to local authorities. And I would like to say that in the new urban agenda, there is clear mention of community land trusts to do this. I would also like to <clears throat> say that in the urgency report on COVID and recovery, one of the things we mentioned is the possibility of having a food safety net, not just social protection, but also a food safety net to ensure that food is available, healthy, sustainably grown local food is available to all. Now, this is the first panel and we have a little time to take one or two interventions from the floor at this point. So I wonder if I could ask people to maybe raise their hands if they wish to intervene. I can only take one or two, so please do raise your hand if you wish to take the floor at this point. I think Isa has raised her hand, Judith. Okay, Isa, and also Carme Gual. Um, maybe Carme, uh, you could speak first because I'm respecting protocol here. Hello. Maybe you can introduce yourself. Yeah, Carme. okay. Thank you, Judith. Uh, nice have, to see you. We have two minutes. Okay, Great. okay, I'll be very short. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me to, to have this a little talk. Um, the, the director of the Catalan Agency for Cooperation for Development, uh, and we have um, quite an agreement with, <laughs> with, uh, no, with you and uh, your organizations, and so uh, we are very happy to be here. And, and I think it's very, very relevant because there are a lot of um, uh, projects that have been raised that uh, probably mm, are very, uh, you know, very community uh, focused. So that's that's the approach that I think that we should be taking uh, uh, from now on, uh, on on all that we do. In fact, in the agency just wanted to add a little bit more. It's like we have this kind of uh, a women's fund uh, that we have in Mozambique, in Senegal, in Colombia, and and it's. Uh, it's been very powerful, basically, on the, during the pandemic, it's been helping a lot, uh, small grassroots organizations that are devoted to human rights, but also for uh, economic, um, you know, to give activity for, for women. So uh, it's been a, a very powerful um, uh, tool to, to go straight to, to the grassroots organizations and, and helping them with the, they, 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 they decide which are the projects that we should, uh, you know, uh, finance. And then there's another line of work that we have is um, that we are opening now. It's like financing uh, through uh, ethic uh, banking, uh, some projects in, um, you know, uh, through our NGOs in Colombia or in Mozambique or in Senegal, just talking on this kind of uh, how do we, get sure that that, we, that that the projects have sustainability and that the people can uh, can can uh, keep their means of of living so many of the issues that were raised today are things that will take big uh, great note and and i'm sure that 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 we have to go further on on this uh just leave it here but uh, i think there was a, a good chance to just to, to to express that we have this kind of need to change the approach and go very very deep into community uh, um, you know uh, development and thinking about the real needs of populations uh, uh, for sure so 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Carme. Um, I will now call on Isa Alvarez. Isa, can you introduce yourself, please? And I, I recognize Alassane and Eri have your hands up, but I'm not sure if we'll get to both of you this time around. Isa. Bueno, gracias. Sí, gracias. Yes. Eh, buenas tardes, buenos días, bueno, buenas noches, donde estéis. Eh, bueno, yo soy Isa Álvarez soy, y soy parte de la red Urgency. Y bueno, primero quiero agradecer a quienes han organizado este espacio porque me parece súper necesario y a las intervenciones que, que ya se han hecho. ¿no? Y quería simplemente, muy brevemente, bueno, simplemente, eh, nada, eh, reforzar algunos mensajes que, que se han comentado, ¿no? Porque creo que, bueno, lo que comentaba Simel de los cuidados, ¿no? Que qué importante los cuidados y creo que también eso va muy relacionado con el trabajo que hacemos alimentario, ¿no? Porque muy relacionado a, a los cuidados eh, y a mucho trabajo de las mujeres ha estado también el que el hambre no sea mayor en en muchas ciudades, ¿no? Y en ese sentido también, eh, un poco vinculado a las respuestas que ha habido en, en esta pandemia, me parece muy importante lo que habéis comentado de los cinturones y de la agricultura periurbana, creo que es muy, muy importante preservar eso, pero también creo que es importante incorporar la mirada territorial más allá de lo urbano y lo, y lo periurbano, ¿no? Porque si algo hemos aprendido en esta pandemia ha sido, por ejemplo, bueno, yo vivo en Europa, vivo en el País Vasco, y hemos visto cómo en muchas ciudades no había tejido comunitario y el poquito tejido comunitario eran o los mercados o los grupos de agricultura sostenida por la comunidad. ¿no? Eh, y entonces, aunque había gente que, que ofrecía ayudar, mucha gente no respondía a sus ofrecimientos porque no se conocían, aunque estaban en el mismo barrio. ¿no? Y ahí, por ejemplo, en muchas ocasiones los... Ha sido interesante cómo las agricultoras y los agricultores de los grupos de agricultura sostenida por la comunidad han hecho un poco el pegamento, ¿no? porque ellos se podían desplazar y no se han desplazado solamente para llevar alimentos, sino que han, bueno, se han puesto de acuerdo con los grupos de apoyo mutuo, que era para otro tipo de cuestiones, para personas mayores, pues eh, medicamentos o otro tipo de, de necesidades, ¿no? porque ahí sí había comunidades creadas, con mayor o menor medida, lo que le podemos llamar comunidad en Europa, pero creo que es muy importante que además de preservar eh, la, la tierra, ¿no? el territorio, también esa necesidad de, de preservar los lazos comunitarios y las relaciones entre, entre nosotras, tanto dentro de los propios barrios como a nivel eh, más territorial. Entonces simplemente quería bueno, reforzar un poco esto y mil gracias por todas las intervenciones. Thank you so much, Isa. And although I said we were only going to take two uh, people from the room, we have not had anybody from Africa and I see that Alassane has his hand up. So Alassane, really two minutes over to you. And if you can turn your video cam on, that would be great. Alasan, are you there? Hello, vous m'entendez? We can hear you perfectly. On t'entend bien. Mets ton caméra si c'est possible. Tu as deux minutes. Ah, ok, parfait. Très bien. Merci beaucoup. Je disais que les espaces comme ça sont très, très importants pour notre travail collectif. Je suis le chef du projet plaidoyer et pour, euh, plaidoyer pour la promotion de l'économie sociale et solidaire comme stratégie pour atteindre le développement durable dans le contexte post-COVID. Je crois que nous avons beaucoup de personnes autour de la table qui connaissent bien le projet. Je dis juste que tout ce qui a été soulevé comme problématique, on le retrouve dans le cadre de l'intervention du projet au niveau de l'Afrique avec RAS, c'est-à-dire le réseau africain d'économie sociale et solidaire. Nous avons fait une petite enquête. Les gens sont beaucoup frappés par les impacts de, les, de, de la COVID. Et la question qui est posée, on le traite sous forme de... De, de sécurité alimentaire, ce qu'on a perçu, nous, 
ce qui est en lien avec la sécurité alimentaire, les femmes qui avaient des petites entreprises qui faisaient des repas pour les gens quand elles ont fermé toutes ces populations qui mangeaient dans leurs restaurants avaient des problèmes. Donc, c'est la production, oui, mais c'est aussi la disponibilité et c'est aussi l'accompagnement des femmes par rapport aux services publics qu'elles rendent par rapport à la chaîne de, 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 de sécurité alimentaire. Donc, l'inégalité que nous voyons dans le processus actuel vers ce qu'on appelle le secteur informel, c'est leur considération dans les plans, dans les processus de relance. C'est leur considération dans l'accès aux ressources c'est leur considération aussi comme utilité publique pour accéder à des financements pour pouvoir mener leur activité. Donc, je dis des espaces comme ça, les expériences qui ont été dites, on peut partager les uns et les autres. Je crois qu'à travers Socio-Eco, et puis on a des, 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 des échanges avec, euh, et je dis vous-même, avec. Euh, C'est très important qu'on multiplie ces espaces. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Alassane. Merci je beaucoup. Je vais t'arrêter là. I'm going to stop you there, Alassane. Also, Merci. I recognize that Eri, you have your hand up, but we will come back to you after the second panel. I would just like to ask our panelists if they have a one minute reaction to any of the remarks that have been made from the floor, please. Um, I'll take you in reverse order this time. André, do you have any reaction to anything that was said from the floor? One minute. Sí, muchas gracias. Creo que un punto central, como había dicho, es la cuestión de planeamiento urbano y la gestión de las políticas urbanas para que se pueda agregar todas estas nuestras discusiones acerca de economía solidaria y de redes de suministro y también la perspectiva de soberanía alimentaria. Este es un punto central para nueva agenda urbana es el punto de planeamiento y participación social en los consejos con espacios de conferencias y producción colectiva a esta materia. Gracias. Thank you, André. I fully agree that urban planning is a critical point moving forward. Um, next, Simel. Can we have a one minute reaction from you? Okay, sorry, I was muted. On the care point, I would say that it's really important now with the pandemic, there is increased attention to the care deficits and care needs uh, and responsibilities that we bring in the social and solidarity economy models that are emerging in care provision, community-based model to the attention of policymakers. Uh, this is some uh, an opportune time, that is one, and I shared the link uh, on this with you all. And the other one would be on the informal economy workers, cooperatives, collectives, and social economy initiatives. The local government is critical, not just as regulator, but also uh, in terms of training services, in terms of uh, financing, in terms of providing space. And uh, I think we really need to uh, highlight uh, this point uh, further uh, in our work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sonia, a one minute comment, perhaps? Yes, thank you. Uh, I want to uh, second the relevance of uh, what was said around uh, food safety nets, particularly for informal workers in general, not only way speakers, and also to pick up on what Andre and uh, Simel said and kind of uh, yeah, bring them all together. I think it, yeah, it's very important that we we have planning as something that it's it's acknowledged with a seat at the table for informal workers in general, and also uh, the relevance of local government to institute planning uh, platforms, but also to have a system for monitoring of implementation of, of what is planned. Very often, what is planned doesn't agree with what is implemented. So compliance you know, and implementation uh, to what we plan is very critical for the livelihoods of the uh, urban poor. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Nelson, a very quick reaction from you before we move on to our second mm -hmm. panel. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> bueno, eh, yo pienso que la cuestión de la planificación es, estoy de acuerdo que es fundamental y la cuestión de la democracia y la participación eh, de los habitantes de la ciudad ¿no? eh, es crucial. Eh, mas yo pienso que de, de forma estratégica también deberíamos imbricar más ¿no? la, esas políticas de la economía solidaria, social, la cuestión de la producción de, de alimentación, eh, con la cuestión de la agenda de los cambios climáticos, ¿no? porque cuanto más se tiver ¿no? eh, espacios, por eso que hablé de espacios públicos, ¿no? de espacios urbanos, para essas atividades, como a, a produção não? De, de alimentos dentro de la nossas cidades, como são as hortas urbanas, comunitárias. Me parece que é uma estratégia também para se combater a questão dos cambios climáticos, não? de se ter mais qualidade, mais áreas eh, permeáveis no, e proteção do meio ambiente. Eu penso que essa é uma questão clave também em nossas mensagens, não? de embricar la, la política social, mas também imbricada com a política do câmbio climático, não? E já que estamos justamente dentro deste é, High Level Panel, não? sobre a questão da sustentabilidade. Thank you so much, Nelson. I really agree with you that we need to include the issue of climate change. And with the pandemic, it was really clear that global value chains did break down, as several people mentioned and territorial and local markets were the way of resilience. The path of resilience was very clearly social solidarity economy and ensuring that we built our social relationships within the cities and rebuilt them around a new way of thinking and acting together. Now, I would like to move on to our second panel we have one very key question that we have not addressed, which is of course at the heart of the global platform for the right to the city, which is the question of housing. And to talk about this, we're going to move to Asia and I'm going to call upon Norlisa Hashim. She is the chief executive of Urbanize Malaysia which is a center of excellence of the Ministry of Housing and Local Environment in Malaysia. And I would like to remind you that Malaysia is one of the countries that is doing the voluntary national review in this session of the HLPF, because that is the context of the uh, side event today. So Norlisa, over to you and you have Six minutes, please. Thank you, Judith. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for having us uh, from Malaysia here. Um, uh, first and foremost, uh, I would like to, you know, uh, share with you. Probably some of you are not aware where we are located, uh, Malaysia. We are on a Southeast Asia nation, and uh, we are not a big country with only thirty-two point two seven million population. Uh, however, we are quite an urbanized uh, uh, country with more almost 79% urbanization. And I think uh, as uh, every other city and nation is facing today, uh, Malaysia is also not spared from the uh, pandemic. And what is a health crisis uh, today for us has also become a socioeconomic crisis. Uh, I think just as many countries statistics we are also uh, having unemployment in our country and our uh, economic uh, GDP has also declined uh, and quite greatly actually. And uh, there's a lot of decrease in income, almost about 46%. And a lot of small medium enterprises have actually wind up uh, their businesses and operations. Now I'm asked to uh, look into housing specifically, which is a very important part of this discussion on social solidarity. And I think uh, for Malaysia, when we talk about housing, it has always been a national agenda. 
And housing has been something that uh, has been a joint commitment between the government as well as uh, the private sector. But when we talk about the pandemic itself, I think uh, there, you know, how do we really take care of some of the major issues that uh, housing, living are really going through? And during this pandemic, uh, we have more than 25 million of our population that actually lives in urban areas. And um, a lot of our uh, urban communities are actually uh, not coping very well, especially those in the bottom 40 as we define our urban poor uh, community. And this is mainly uh, because of loss of income where they have tend to be uh, less uh, secured in terms of their financials and social security. And of late, uh, we are also uh, uh, having a lot of mental health uh, issues among our urban poor community, which has become a, a big concern. And most important, some of our female-led households are becoming more vulnerable as, as more and more of them are becoming unemployed. So some of the major contribution that has led to uh, some of the issues that we've been having in uh, because of the pandemic is of course uh, the kind of living conditions that we also have in our cities where mainly in major cities here in Malaysia, people are actually living in high density areas. And this has led to other kinds of health challenges besides uh, the COVID-19. And this is something that uh, we are dealing with. And it's something that uh, apart from just taking care of the pandemic, taking care of the uh, economic issues, uh, we are now challenged with the issues of uh, stress, anxiety, you know, uh, among the, the community that uh, are living in uh, uh, the urban areas. Um, Malaysia has always emphasized on uh, reducing disparity. In fact, our vision 2030 actually uh, is very much central, centralized on the shared prosperity vision. And here, uh, one of the key objectives is addressing wealth and income disparities. And of course, uh, looking at some of our targets, uh, one of it is of course, looking at uh, uh, access to hope, better homes and decent kind of incomes that uh, our urban communities uh, must have. But uh, with the COVID-19, uh, looking at housing, looking at the uh, social security of communities, uh, it's, no, it's no longer just a national government's uh, responsibility. We are seeing now cities uh, which are not their uh, everyday business are uh, now looking into all kinds of issues. Uh, economic uh, issues with regards to providing jobs at the local areas, as well as providing better condition uh, living and overcoming some of the poverty issues, the homelessness issues that have started to creep up in cities. So because in Malaysia, our local government are actually not autonomous. And because of that, it has never been in their, uh, their responsibility to actually manage some of these issues. Uh, so we have actually, uh, one of the big issues that we have is we have 10% of our employment uh, are low income foreign workers. And because of the pandemic, uh, uh, you know, it probably is a blessing for them. Uh, we have started to regulate uh, them in proper workers quarters with amenities and facilities. And also for the homeless uh, people from temporary shelters, now they are starting to get proper shelters. And not only that, uh, they are also given vaccination and a lot of them are now being put into training, uh, giving skills, temporary jobs, you know, uh, so that, you know, because that will be one of the better way of managing the, uh, the uh, spread of the uh, COVID if they were to be uh, still on, on the outside. So, uh, and also one of the other things that a lot of cities have started is going back to basics, which is going back to urban farming, where this is one of the way where we are ensuring uh, local food security for the community. So you are, we are seeing now uh, a lot of uh, unutilized land being used for urban farms. Our homeless people are being taught on how to be urban farmers. And of course, uh, our communities at the uh, lower income housing are also uh, now starting to 
be, uh, to have urban farms in their uh, outside areas. But I think one of the important things that we observe in this uh, whole uh, pandemic is uh, also the inclusive uh, recovery that is very important, where it's not only the role of the government or just the role of the national or the local government, but it's the role of the community themselves. Uh. And this is where um, we are seeing a lot of uh, NGOs, CSOs, and just community groups just coming together, addressing every issue that they see creeping up uh, every day in, in the papers and in the media. And we have currently now a white flag program, for example, where communities will raise up a white flag if they, uh, if they are in need for food or any kind of help. And this has gone quite viral in, in, in Malaysia and people are just reaching out for each other. And I think um, you know, that is something that uh, is quite amazing on how uh, people have actually respond to the situation and how to build actually resilience among the community groups. Uh, so Thank I think in uh, moving forward, yep, yep. This is my last slide. Yeah. I apologize. Yep. Okay, it Judith. Is absolutely exemplary how you have turned a vicious circle where people in informal economy lose their jobs, lose their ability to buy food, lose their yes. homes into a safer, healthier environment where they have access to housing and to social protection and also to health and food. So thank you for that. And I would now like to call upon the last, but not the least of our panelists. Vic van Buren, you, uh, you were for many years the director of the social enterprise part of the ILO and you are the leader of the UN Interagency Task Force on Social and Solidarity Economy. So you've been following all of this. Can you share some of your thoughts and ideas for Paths Forward with us, please? Hi, thank you, Judith. Hi, everyone. You know, I think we need to, to take stock of this at a macro level very briefly and then, and then drill down to the topics that we've been talking about today. Now, the world of work has been profoundly affected by the pandemic. I mean, we all know that. We've entered the second semester of 2021, still facing an unprecedented crisis in jobs and incomes and heightened levels of uncertainty. That's notwithstanding the, the vaccine that has now um, given us a, a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. The pandemic has exposed many fragilities in our economies and societies and deepened existing inequalities while highlighting the need for resilience, innovation, and cooperation. Now, the pre-crisis challenges have worsened significantly as a consequence of the measures taken to counteract the health emergency. So it's a double whammy, if I can put it that way. A rights-based response needs to include putting workers' rights and the needs, aspirations, and rights of all people at the heart of economic, social, and environmental policies. And this is not only at the macro level, this drills right down through all levels of society, right down to the, the cities and the, and the rural areas. The UN Task Force uh, on Social and Solidarity Economy is made up of 17 agencies, plus the OECD and its 14 civil society organizations and research institutes as observers. And it is imperative for us that recovery plans address the root causes of this crisis by building stronger health systems, working to minimize the number of people that live in poverty, addressing gender inequality, and advancing a healthier environment, more sustainable local food systems, and more resilient societies. So the challenges before the pandemic remain during the pandemic, but even more acute. The recovery plan should be conceived in line with long-term development strategies based on our common framework set by the Sustainable Development Goals. We do need a plan, and we have to follow a plan. We can't just have a knee-jerk reaction. And so we need to build forward better. Moreover, governance at national and local levels should, in consultation with social partners, develop public policies in strategic social economic sectors for a better recovery from the crisis. The complexity of the crisis that we're now facing requires an enormous amount of resources, which furthermore calls for a cooperation between the private and public sector at all levels. 
The social and solidarity economy can play an important role due, its, due to its specific characteristics, as private enterprises often operate in areas of public utility. Multi-stakeholder partnerships are key to designing relevant and innovative, innovative public policies to better overcome this crisis and to transform it into an opportunity to make fundamental changes and to allow for much needed transformation of our society, our economy, and the environment while reducing equality. It's important that we keep these three components together, the society, the economy, and the environment. At the local level, SSE can be a key actor to advancing decentralized, but inclusive and sustainable cities and human settlements that ensure job opportunities, health education, leisure, and culture for all its inhabitants. It's at this bottom grassroots level that we can and will make a difference. This close interlinkage between SSE and local economic development and resilience through a territorial system approach constitutes a driver for SDGs localization. Indeed, SSE organizations in many regions of the world have been showing their contribution, and we've heard many stories today about this, in the advancement of decent work. For instance, one major role in the SSE's contribution to transition from informal to, in, to formal economy allowing individuals and communities to organize themselves and strengthen the collective voice and representation is certainly at the forefront of activities. Moreover, SSE organizations appear to be well suited to advancing women's economic participation. We need to put this as a focus point because women have been the most affected by this pandemic. And this we do by increasing access to employment and work, enabling economic democracy and boosting leadership and engagement experience. Nine of the biggest 100 cooperative and mutual insurers in the world have women CEOs, compared to only one of the top 100 stock company insurers. SSE organizations also show that they are resilient in times of crisis. This is thanks to their roots at local level. And once again, we, we emphasize the importance of local level. This was the case during and in the aftermath of the 20. 2001, 2000, uh, um, was it 2011, 2012 financial crisis in Argentina, the 2007 and 8 global financial crisis, sorry, Argentina was 2001 and 2002, and 2009 to 2017, the debt crisis in Greece. In many countries, uh, the, the performance of SSE organizations was better than the traditional private sector. While it was possible to observe cases of job preservation through the creation of worker cooperatives in the different regions of the world. And in conclusion, I wish to state that during the crisis, the SSE organizations are ensuring health care for the elderly by providing protection, assistance, and prevention. Moreover, it is observed that SSE organizations respond to traditional needs and emerging ones. It's important that we complement the role played by the public sector, which is key in terms of access to fundamental rights and essential services. From the UNTFSSE's perspective, it is important to work at all levels, starting from city level by sharing positive practices and experiences among the different territories and at the national level by advancing regulatory frameworks and reinforcing the ecosystems, especially in developing economies. At the international level, we believe it's important that we also play a key role in positioning the SSE. In general, the discussion of the 110th session of the International Labor Conference in 2022 is very timely to discuss the role of SSE for a human-centered future of work. I look forward to working together with, with uh, the SSE players at all levels, because this is how we can make a difference to the lives of people where it matters the most. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Vic. Now I'm going to open up the floor and take two or three one minute interventions. I see Eri Junarini has had her hand up almost since the beginning. Eri, I'm going to give the floor to you, followed by Rob and Katerina Fahir, who is also waiting patiently. One minute each. Okay, thank you, uh, Judith. My name is Eri. I come from Indonesia. 
involved in the ASEAN Solidarity Economic uh, Council as well in Indonesia. I'm part of the, uh, the SSE movement. So uh, the impact of the COVID, mostly we have heard about the let off of the workers that makes impacted on uh, a lot of a uh, jobless. This we have uh, already come and hear from every, every discussions, yeah? But, uh, but at the first, uh, uh, to promote the SSE uh, uh, in the post-COVID, we have to convince that the SSE enterprises has bring better, better uh, effect during the crisis. So for example, in the Indonesian discussions, I have heard from the fair trade forum that actually the fair trade companies has uh, less, uh, has, uh, has do, uh, has do what you call it, uh, has do not let off their workers comparing to the uh, business as usual companies. So that means if we can have the data that uh, with the SSA enterprises that the jobless uh, situations are better during this crisis, a pandemic crisis, though, might be we can convince the world to, 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 to use this paradigm, SSE economic as the new paradigm uh, in the post-COVID. I would like to ask the email, maybe they have, uh, she has the data on the, on the impact of the SSE enterprises on the jobless. Thank you. Thank you, Eri. I'd like to pass over now to Rob Robinson. Rob, can you share sure. some words of wisdom with us? Sure, thank you, Judith, and thank you to everybody who commented. There were some fantastic comments today. My name is Rob Robinson. I am based in New York City. I am here as a representative of the International Alliance of Inhabitants and the Global Platform on the Right to the City. I think COVID-19 in the US has highlighted or underscored, if you will, inequalities with respect to land access, healthcare, food and security, housing and work situations along with education. I think the people most directly affected were street vendors in the informal economy and what we call canners or what the rest of the world calls recyclers. Um, informal settlements, something the United States doesn't make lay claim to. People living in 10 cities on the West Coast are in informal settlements. People living on the streets of New York City are in informal settlements. So we need to pay attention to that. Um, we need to find those pathways to uh, decent work conditions, as somebody mentioned earlier. And I think the informal economy is taking root in New York City in ways that we've never expected. But to make this effective, the U.S. as a whole is going to have to adhere to human rights principles and values, which it often doesn't. It, it uses the cover of a quote unquote democracy to say we don't have to adhere to those standards of values and principles. So I'll leave it at that. I'll put in the chat a document that identifies those groups that I think are powerful with respect to the informal economy. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Rob. Now I'd like to give the floor quickly to Katerina Fahir, who's been waiting patiently. You have one minute, Katerina. Your microphone, yes. Yes, now I, I couldn't unmute myself. I would like to thank all of you for a lot of inspiration. I'm uh, representing Sweden, but I'm working in the city of Malmö, uh, city hall, uh, Never mind. I just wanted really, really to admire what Malaysia just told us because it's another state of mind uh, that I noticed in the things that you said. Who was speaking? I, I, I missed the name. Was it Norlisa? I, yes, thank you very much because this is so, so forward what Europe, I think, uh, and now I'm talking for myself, not Sweden, <laughs> we are not, uh, yeah, just this is me thinking. Uh, so I think Europe is quite a lot behind because this is totally different set of mindset where you actually see who needs help, where you actually do whatever you can without thinking, why is the person on the street? Why is the person homeless? Why is the person addict i don't know never mind uh, and this is the problem i think in europe uh, or any house sweden we have national systems that are so good but so hard to switch and change and when, when the crisis hits you have to act fast so i just i it just blew me away so i would really really like to thank you for this uh, what you said because it's another key that a lot of us missed we need a different state of mind to to make change and the, the other thing 
What is my minute finished? Okay, thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you so much for that comment. Um, I would like to just go back now one minute to Norlisa and one minute to Vic, and then we will wind up. I think we're managing time here fairly well. So over to you, Norlisa. Um, thank you so much, Judith. Yeah, thank you, Katerina, for the uh, kind words. Yeah, um, I'm also learning a lot from everyone here, and I, I totally believe that, you know, Social solidarity is definitely very, very important to overcome this uh, COVID-19 situation, you know. And this is where uh, everybody's role is so important. And I think if people can just step up and forget about all the levels of uh, bureaucracies that we have, I think we can overcome a lot of issues together. Uh, we have our own challenges also in Malaysia, uh, where, you know, time to time we, we do have... Uh, interventions coming in but uh, I think what the people has shown is that you know they can they can do it and they, they care and when they care I think they can overcome a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, crisis that's happening and I think that's reaching out we have a slogan here in Malaysia uh, Judith and everyone it's called kita jaga kita it means that we look out for each other uh, you know so it's been a slogan since the day one we had our first COVID case and it's actually blown up quite big and I'm quite proud of the of the you know the small initiatives that's done by everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Vic? Thank you. Uh, you know little do we realize the treasure that we sit with when we talk about the SSE but unfortunately not enough people understand and know about the social and solidarity economy and the impact that it can have for the betterment uh, of reducing the social deficit. The first point is we need to recognize the devastation that is and hardship that has been caused by this pandemic. And that we, through the value system that the SSE offers and the uh, focus of what it's about, can make such a huge difference in the communities and the societies in which we find ourselves. The second part is that the youth are looking for solutions going forward. We have a hugely despondent group of youth out there. The SSE offers not only hope, but it offers a way and means of, of the youth getting involved and making societies a better place, not only for themselves, but for those around them. And we need to take this forward to the youth and involve them far more than we have in the past. And these are some of the points that I think we should take forward from this meeting in a much more courageous way. Thank you. Judith, I don't know if it's only. We can't me. hear you, Judith. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why. No, no. Now we can hear you. Thank you. I said, I don't know if you're aware of it, but there is a huge movement globally to bring youth to the fore, and I totally support that. Nelson, we have a couple of minutes left. I would like to call on you to make a few closing remarks before I wrap up. Would you, would you like to address a few closing remarks to everybody watching us, please? Uh, gracias. Eh, no, solamente que me parece que tenemos que seguir, ¿no? Eh, es, con esta perspectiva de, de trabajar la, las cuestiones. Eh, dentro de estos espacios institucionales eh, y también yo, yo pienso que por parte de la plataforma estamos construyendo un, un documento político que es sobre justamente las, las derechos de la ciudad y las conexiones entre urbano y rural ¿no? que que vamos a trabajar este semestre y me parece muy importante que la, todas las personas que están acá no puedan participar de este proceso que, que vamos a estar con, organizando por parte de la plataforma y también eh, la, la, la incidencia eh, política en este balance que me parece importante también de la nueva agenda urbana eh, de llevarnos estas cuestiones 
eh, como claves ¿no? para los países cuanto a los compromisos que tienen que seguir haciendo. ¿no? En especial, eh, me parece que esas mensajes claves que estamos discutiendo acá precisan llegar de forma más directa, objetiva en nuestros países ¿no? y para también los gobernantes de nuestras ciudades. Y yo pienso que esto podemos estar contribuyendo por parte de la plataforma. Thank you so much, Nelson. So we are coming to towards the end of this very, very exciting side event. You will have noticed that nobody mentioned what we are fighting as well in terms of the neoliberal forces that are pushing us down and that we need to overcome. But I think it's good that we have not mentioned them because we are working, looking forward and building our positive responses. And we are doing it collectively and we are doing it at all levels. And this is what SDG 17 is about. It is about these partnerships. It is about networking all the good practice between our different sectors and doing it through an alternative, a different approach to the economy, which is the social and solidarity economy. I would like to thank all of our speakers deeply for the time and thoughtfulness that they've made and the contributions they've made, including those from the floor. I would like to thank our back room, in particular, Sophia and Julie, who have made the technicalities possible. And most of all, I would like to thank our three interpreters, Consuelo Gianzante, Jorge Soriano, and Jasiara Topli Lira, because you have done us proud and supported us throughout this hour and a half. And without you, we couldn't do it. And as we know, there will not be any revolution without interpretation. So thank you all, and it's been a wonderful moment, and I look forward to following up on all of this with all of you, and have a good day, and thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.